I don't believe that all these ideas are optimal, but I'm willing to accept them as part of a compromise. He does deserve some credit uh, for some incremental entitlement reforms, but I would hope that uh, he would not uh, hold hostage these modest uh, uh, reforms uh, for his demand for bigger tax cut. Tax hikes. The offer that is there for Speaker Boehner is not an a la carte menu, and you can't decide to only pick out the concessions the president has made and not include the concessions that are from the Republican side. It looks like there's less than $600 billion worth of reduction in there, and that's over a decade, all of it coming, not surprisingly, from tax increases. Okay, overview of this budget and what you heard today, Charles. It's more of the same. It's tax and spend. Uh, I think they cleverly were able to get the press to believe that there was a huge Nixon uh, to China concession with the change in the calculation of inflation, which creates a minuscule shifting of the curve on Social Security. It's a uh, quarter of a penny uh, on the dollar. It's a very small change, and it's a technical one. The president's own budget states that the change in the CPI is a correction. It's actually simply a way of achieving accuracy. And why a correction is a concession, I'm not sure I understand. It's in the national interest. So I think that's way been overemphasized. The fact is McConnell is right. The reduction in the debt is minuscule. It's all as a, uh, as a result of taxes. And second, the, the kind of reductions that you get are all in the future. After Obama leaves office, this Congress does not have the power to direct the Congresses of the end of the, the decade in all the supposed the cuts. What Obama does is he canceled the real cuts, the sequestered cuts of over a trillion dollars today in return for these imaginary or projected ones that are going to happen in the future, which will not happen in the future. So it actually is a huge, I think, a disappointment. McCain's campaign has gone even further, suggesting that the best answer for the growing pressures on Social Security might be to cost, uh, might be to cut uh, cost of living adjustments or raise the retirement age. Now, let me be clear: I will not do either. Pretty much everybody in Washington understands that this is highly unlikely that there will be anything like a grand bargain. Uh, Paul Ryan said pretty much uh, directly today that he didn't think there was going to be a grand bargain because the kinds of things that we're talking about, the fact that the president didn't go further on entitlement reform, means that there won't be a grand bargain. The way I would answer your question is to say we're going to need a bigger boat. Uh, Obama's offering the most minuscule change. The CPI is recommended by every commission in the last 20 years. It is obvious. It's a correction. It means that today, the whole point of indexing Social Security with inflation was a way to protect seniors. What th this does is that every year it protects them and it gratuitously, and without intending to, adds on to that. All this is doing is correcting it. And as I said, if you get a $2,000 check from the government, it removes a $5 bill, and that's devastating Social Security. If this is where we are stuck, we're never going to achieve anything, and we're going to end up like Cyprus. But there is discretionary cuts in this budget, but they happen after the president leaves, 2017 to 2023, $200 billion after he leaves office. So It's what he's done every year he's been in office. He always argues we have to expand the government now. We have to spend now. He used the word invest, and later we will cut. We are now at later, and he's still arguing the same thing, expand and spend now and cut. Their actions and their words uh, have not helped diffuse a combustible situation. In the event that that does not occur, um, as we have said uh, many times, uh, our country uh, is fully prepared to deal with uh, any contingency, any action that uh, uh, North uh, Korea may uh, uh, take or any provocation that uh, they may instigate. And uh, we have contingencies uh, prepared uh, to do that. In the absence of concrete evidence to the contrary, we have to assume the worst case. And that's, that's why we're postured as we are today. You know, we reported about this communication line that is open uh, up in New York, and they have 
the U.S. communicated in March with North Korea before, before all this bluster started. It was interesting that they, they chose to do that at that time. I'm not sure it's in response to anything that we have done. I think this is in response to internal events, the rise of this little guy who is either in charge or he's a puppet of his uncle or others. We don't really understand. But I think there are two uh, scenarios. The, the good one, the one where there is an off-ramp is he builds up all the tension with all the rhetoric and then he shoots off this missile that doesn't have a nuke on it and it lands harmlessly in the Pacific Ocean. It's like a Woody Allen Kubrick movie and it's over. The second is that he doesn't have an off-ramp and he doesn't know what to do. He, the, the bellicosity increases. He, he feels he has to show his strength and perhaps he believes that he's being surrounded. America wants to invade. I mean, these people are paranoid and crazy at the same time. I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's, it's more likely that scenario one happens, but we have to be prepared for scenario two. It seems as if the military is. I'm not sure about the political leadership on our side. Has been a Sunfish production.